My wife and I put our roots down and planted Covenant Church in Grove City nearly 10 years ago. God allowed us to fall in love with this town, not just because of the hometown culture or the community who's truly become like family to us, but God allowed us to fall in love with Grove City because there is a lifetime worth of work for the gospel to be done right here. And I truly believe that the best is yet to come. That's why I love Grove City. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? Good to have you all here. Uh, we're excited about week two of I Love Grove City. If you haven't been here before, we're glad that you're here. Uh, if you're joining us live today, uh, you're a family just as much as if you're sitting in this room. We're glad and happy to have you. A couple things you should know about us is that we're a church that worships in spirit and in and in truth. We like to take these truths, we write them down, and we take them into our small groups. If you're not in a Sea Life group, that's what they're, they are, they're called, Sea Life groups. If you're not in a Sea Life group, you are missing out on who we are as a church. Amen. I mean, that's where we're doing life. That's where we're finding girlfriends, uh, hopefully girlfriend, by the way. Uh, we're finding, I mean, relationships. We're making friends. I mean, it's awesome. But apart from that, you're going to grow in your relationship with Christ. You're going to grow in your leadership opportunities. And there's just great discipleship that takes place there. So I would encourage you to jump into a sea life because for us, Sunday is just the start. Uh, we got a lot to cover today. And uh, as always, not a lot of time to do it. So I'm just going to jump in. We're in week two of I Love Grove City, and today we're talking about this core value of, 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 of bringing our friends. In fact, we would say it like this, we bring our friends. Turn to your neighbor right now and just say, we bring our friends. Now, here's the understanding. I loved what Pastor Seth just said. It's not just that we bring our friends to church. It's not just that we bring our friends to an outreach opportunity. It's that we bring our friends to Jesus. Okay, if I can get an amen in a, Baptist church, in a Baptist church on a Sunday morning after that, we may be in for a little bit stronger of a teaching. I said, we bring our friends to Jesus, amen? Amen, amen exactly. And so it's not enough to bring your friend to a church service. It's not. It's not enough to bring them to an outreach opportunity. Those are all well and good, but your goal, our mission, is to bring our friends to Jesus. I, I love this, this quote by one of my favorite pastors. His name is Charles Spurgeon. He says this, and it goes pretty hard, so hang tight. He says, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees. Let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. Let that sink in for a second. If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees. Let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. Today, I want you to understand as a church, our mission, our vision is to seek and save the lost. Correct? Yes. And we understand in saying that we don't save anyone. It's the Holy Spirit that saves. But we are the conduit between God and man. We get to the awesome opportunity of building this together. And we get to tell people about Jesus and he uses us. But we have to go out and seek we have to go seek them out, seek out our relatives, our neighbors, our, our friends, whoever it might be. We get to go seek them and see Jesus save them. And I'm just going to warn you uh, up front. I've got five points. I might get through point one, okay, just so you know. And uh, I, I, I do like the days when I'm able to, like, we kind of build a sermon together. You know what I'm talking about? When I'm preaching and I feel like there's maybe a little bit of a response um, one of the challenging things about preaching in a movie theater, which prayerfully we won't, we won't be doing uh, much longer, we'll be talking about that here in the very near future um, this month, but, but one of the things about it is that I can't hear you very well, and uh, I'm, just a, a words, I'm just a words person. You know, some of you guys are like quality time people, not me, I'm a words of affirmation person, and I feel like sometimes we just need to celebrate God's word a little bit. Would you agree with that? I think that for us as a church, it's okay to get a little vocal. It's okay to say amen. We can shout when the Buckeyes play and scream and hoot and holler, but we come in on a Sunday morning, we hear the good news of how we have been raised from the grave, and we just be sitting there like this. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Man, that's not the kind of church we want to be. We want to be alive. We want to be living. We want to seek and save the lost. And I bring that up, not because I want you to make a lot of noise, 
but because I think we have a problem with being quiet, especially as it pertains to the gospel. I love what Martin Luther King Jr. said. He says, the day we see truth and cease to speak is the day we begin to die. The day we see truth and seek to speak is the day we begin to die. Church, we say that we love our city, but if we don't bring them to Jesus, how can we claim to love them? In other words, maybe you could say it like this, when we claim to love but fail to act, we're not showing our love, we are proving our indifference. Just say that again. When we claim to love but fail to act, we are not showing our love, rather we are proving our indifference. And let me just tell you this morning, this is not something we can be indifferent about. The hearts and souls of our friends, of our city, of our countrymen, of our wives and our children is not something we can be indifferent about. And yet we are. And yet we are. Put up some stats, kind of staggering. 55.3 million people die each year. 55. By the way, that is not even including aborted children. So you can at least double that. For 100 million people die each year in our world. 151,600 people die each day. 6,316 people die each hour. 105 people die each minute, and nearly two people die each second. By the time I'm done preaching this sermon, 4,200 people will have died. I can see some of you all being like, wait, hold on, how long are you preaching for? What? Is, what? Right? And, and so what I'm, the reason I'm saying is oftentimes when you hear a pastor start talking about death, you know that there's like an altar call coming, you know, because we're trying to scare people. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to speak some obedience into you. For us, we cannot be indifferent about the fact that around us every day, people we know are dying and entering into eternity without Jesus Christ. Come on, church. We haven't even started this sermon yet, and it's just preaching itself. How can we be okay with people that we know, interact, love, that they go into eternity without Jesus Christ? This is our greatest mission right here. In fact, I want you to look at the book of Mark. Mark chapter 2. I want to read this story to you. I've always loved this story for a number of reasons. Jesus just shows off in it, and he's just bad. He's just bad in this scripture, by the way, and you'll see why. It says this, starting in verse 1 of Mark chapter 2. We ready this morning? Yes? Did we come with a little bit of anticipation? Yeah? Okay. I hope so. It says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum, say Capernaum. Capernaum, Jesus is home. I've been there before. Very small, small, small town. It says, when he returned after some days, it was reported that Jesus was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he, Jesus, preached the word to them. And they came. Who is they? A bunch of guys, a bunch of friends. They bring to Jesus a paralyzed man. And when they could not, these four people, when they could not get near to him because of the crowd, what did they do? They removed the roof above him. And when they made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic or the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. I love that. They couldn't get to Jesus, so what'd they do? They cut a hole out of the roof. Why? Because they thought if we can just get our friend in front of Jesus, everything will be different. If we can can just get him in there, if we can just get him in the presence of Christ, I know everything's going to change. Let me ask you, church, when has that changed for us? When, when When did we forget the understanding that the presence of Christ changes everything? Not just the atmosphere, not just society, not just culture, but it changes the soul. It changes the heart. It changes someone's eternity. Because when you truly have an encounter with the risen Jesus Christ, just ask Paul, you cannot remain the same. Or maybe ask Kanye. Why do we get quiet on that? (laughs) Praise God. Jesus Christ is king. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit 
that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, take your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, I love this phrase, by the way, we've never seen anything like this, which is maybe the understatement of the decade. We've never, I mean, what did they see? Well, they cut a hole out in the roof, lowered a dude down on a bed, got him in front of Jesus. Jesus said, this is crazy. I can't believe your faith. Your, your sins are forgiven. Then he read a bunch of guys' minds, and then he said, oh, by the way, I'm actually going to demonstrate him God, not just by forgiving his sins, but by healing him. So understand there's a lot to unpack in this text. The, the, the primary understanding or primary reading in this text, the central theme, is that Jesus Christ has authority. That's really the, the primary text, right? Um, that he has authority not just to, to, to forgive sin, but also to heal. He is in authority over all, which, by the way, these scribes, which were the religiously elite of the day, they did not like that. Understand, that's why they're there. They're, they're the haters, right? They didn't buy tickets because they liked the show. They're there to see just what is going on. Is this Messiah? Is he, is he for real? Is he... The chosen one, is he the Messiah? Is he the one we've been waiting for? Or is he a blasphemer? Is he, is he going to stir up dissension? Is he going to create a problem? And they're watching. And, and as Jesus says to this man, your sins are forgiven in their brains, in their minds now. They're like, who does this person think he is? And Jesus just turns to them and says, oh, you got a problem with that? What's harder, just to say your sins are forgiven or to heal someone? But for you to understand the power that I have, hey, man, why don't you just pick up your stuff and go home? You're healed. Je- that's why Jesus is bad. That's why Jesus is crazy. Because he doesn't just stop it saying like, oh, you guys must have misunderstood. He pushes it even further. Why? Because scripture tells us that all authority on heaven and under heaven belongs to Jesus Christ. All authority. I love that. You know, when you talk with somebody who's a Christ follower and they're down, I get it, we get depressed, we get down, but you gotta stop living like all authority has not been given to you by Jesus Christ. You gotta stop living like everything is awful. I know we live in brokenness. I know we live in depravity. I know she left you. I know you don't got no money. I get that. But man, we're living for something greater. And the greater is the mission, the missio day, the mission of God, the fact that we get to be a conduit between God and man, introducing people to an eternal life in Jesus Christ. And if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. Come on now. Come on, what gets us excited in here? What gets us excited? All right, I gotta preach my sermon. All right, point number one. In fact, why don't I just give you all five of my points because I don't think I'm gonna get through with them all. Because bring people to Jesus means we must. Here's five points. Point number one, see ourselves as on mission. We must be a people that see ourselves as on mission. Point number two, and I'm gonna unpack as many of these as I can today. You'll unpack them more in your sea life groups. Number two, we must be a people worth following. If you missed these, don't worry. You can go back on our podcast, listen to them. Number three, we must understand that you may be, we may be our friends only linked to meeting Jesus. Bring our friends means that we must build relational currency. Point number four, we must build relational currency. And number five, we must be bold in our invitation. Let's start with point number one, see ourselves as on mission. Can I just say this to us this morning? We need to shift the way that we view who we are and what we do. Can we just make that shift today? We as a people, we as Christians, we as a church, we need to shift the way that we see who we are, view who we are and what we do. Most people define themselves by what they do. Hello, I'm Travis and I'm a baker. Hello, I'm Sarah and I'm a stay-at-home mom. Hello, I'm Jason, and I'm a chiropractor. Hello, I'm Doug, and I do drywall. It doesn't matter what it is. That is how we define. That is how we identify ourselves. But understand, this this got got me so hyped. That's not how God views us. Do you know how God views us primarily? As his sons and daughters. You're like, okay, why is that a big deal? Oh, it's, it's such a big deal. And let me, let me go a little on this. Okay, I know we've talked about this a little bit, but it's so, it's so rich theologically. It's so good. I just got to take time to talk about it. There's this thing called imputed righteousness. See, when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, all of my sins were, and here's the key word, imputed 
onto him, which is to say, even though they were not his, they were counted as his. You understand what I'm saying? Right? And, and in that moment, all my sin, you say all, how much you mean? All. All my past, all my present, all my, come on church, all my what? Future sin was all in that moment imputed onto Christ, counted as his. And then what did Jesus do? He took it to the grave. He took my sin and your sin to the grave. If you're listening this morning, wherever you're from, I don't know what you've done. I don't know where you've been. You are not defined by what you are not defined by what you've done. You should be defined by who's coming after you, and that's Jesus Christ. And when you encounter Jesus, you are redefined by him as a son, as a daughter, as forgiven. Because while my sin was given to him, what was given to me? His righteousness. My sin was imputed to Christ. He carried it. And it was so nasty, and it was so heavy, that it made God the Father turn his face, made Jesus scream out in pain and say, Father, why have you forsaken me? I'll tell you why. It's because Jesus in that moment was carrying every single sin that the world would ever commit on his shoulders. And in that very moment, Sin was not the only thing imputed. His righteousness was imputed to me, which means though I am not just, I am counted as justified. Though I am not good, I am counted as worthy. Though I am sinful, I am counted as sinless. Why? Because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his imputed righteousness. Do you understand what that means? It means that all my sins are forgiven. See, the only thing worse than struggling with sin as a Christian is struggling with the guilt and shame that sin leaves you with. Come on. We don't want to say amen to that because some of us are still wrestling with that. Yeah? Stop. Stop it. Can I just just allow the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ to set some of you free today? Some of you are wrestling with sin that Jesus has forgotten. Now think about that for a minute. You're wrestling with sin that God isn't even acknowledging anymore. You're wrestling with stuff you did when you were 16, things you looked at last year, things you thought about yesterday that Jesus said, I've forgiven you, I've forgotten, and I died for it. My righteousness is imputed. You're worried about your stance before Christ when your stance has always been son. And you're like, I just need to get stronger. No. You need to speak truth over your life. You need to speak the word of God louder than the lies of the enemy because that's how he works. He comes to you. He speaks untruth to you. And you need to give that to the Lord because he's forgiven you. I'm still on my first point. It's so important for us to understand that we as a people are on mission. We need to see ourselves as on mission. We need to see ourselves as sons of God. And that's my point. I, I, I shouldn't say, hi, I'm Travis. I'm a pastor. Uh, I'm a husband, and I've got 9,000 kids. That's not how I should introduce myself, right? Because if that's how I introduce myself, that's how I see myself. That's not how I primarily should see myself. I should see myself as a son of God. Because when I see myself as a son of God, then I can only see the mission I'm called to. By the way, some of y'all down in the mouth, we're, anxi- we're anxious, we're, we're, we're stressed. I get that. But that's this life. Praise God we are not staying here. Praise God my life is bigger than my bank account. Praise God for that. Amen. Praise God that our life is larger than the broken relationships. Praise God. That my life is about something greater than the home I live in, the car that I drive, the status or celebrity that I hold or lose. Praise God that my life is about the mission of building the cause and kingdom of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you what, it's a mission, it's a cause that's greater than any of our lives. And we get to be a part of it. And here's the problem, we're indifferent. We're indifferent. And we can hoop and holler in here, but we're indifferent. Our lives prove our indifference. Our non-words prove our indifference. 
Our non-speaking truth and sharing the love of Christ proves our indifference. It does. When 55 million people die and enter into eternity and we just sit here and listen with indifference, it proves our indifference. Listen to me, brother. Listen to me, sister. Listen to me. You are a son. You are a daughter of God. The moment that you gave your life to Christ, you were recruited into the army of Jesus Christ. You're like, that's some strong language. It sure is. And it's also some strong expectations because the expectation now is that you don't waste the imputed righteousness that's been given over you, but that rather you go out into the world and tell the gospel, teach the nations, disciple people, make, make people into believers. That's your calling. That's our opportunity. We must see ourselves as on mission. On mission. See, you're an everyday missionary. Uh, I got to say this. I used to get into a lot of trouble <laughs> when I was little, like a lot of trouble. Um, because I, I, my parents stopped letting me stay the night at people's houses when I was, I don't know, like six or seven. This is a true story. Um, because whenever I would stay, this is very true. Whenever I would stay the night at my friend's houses, uh, my parents would always get a call from their parents the next day saying, uh, what did your kid tell my kid last night? Because I, would, I just would lead with the question when we're in bed, you know, hey, if you died right now, do you know where you go tomorrow? Or do you know where you go? I'd always lead with that question, right? Now, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was, I can tell you I was scaring, well, I was scaring some, I was trying, I was scaring something out of them. I don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't feel bad about it. I was just, wrong approach. <laughs> Maybe right heart, but wrong approach. My dad was like, Travis, you got to tone it down, son. Like, tone it down. And I was like, but, but no, I can't, right? I love that. But you know what I hate? Is that I got domesticated. I hate the fact that I became domesticated. Like after a while, I learned a technique, or I learned when to talk, or I need to bide my time, or I, I, learned, I, I became domesticated. You know, my, my family, we're always watching these National Geographic shows, and it's, it's amazing to see these lions out on the prairie and the plains, like ripping apart zebras and gazelles and just eating them. I, I just love it. It's amazing, right? Sorry, vegetarians. It's an amazing thing. But one of the saddest things is when you go to a zoo and see that beast behind bars. Now, when you first catch a wild animal like that, they'll pace around the fence, but eventually they'll just settle for living in the middle and being fed. I wonder for us as Christians, as our faith become domesticated, you were created to roam the plains. You were created to go seek out and save the lost on mission, and we have been okay with showing up, sitting back, and just being fed. Shame on us. You are on mission. By the way, I think part of this is this understanding that there's this capital M lowercase m ministry mentality. You know, like, well, you're a professional, Travis. You're capital M ministry. I'm lowercase m. You know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm trying, but lowercase m. That's what I used to think, too. And then I got in the ministry, and I realized I've always been in ministry. Six-year-old Travis sharing his faith, not having any clue what he's doing, just broken for the hearts and souls of my friends, was just as much in ministry as 38-year-old Travis, who's now a pastor. You are just as much a minister of the gospel as I am. Did you hear me? Church. Maybe even more. You know what my job is? We read this last week. According to Ephesians, my job is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. To equip you. You do know that's why God designed the church, church. Not to be a place that we belong and show up to, but really, honestly, the exact opposite, a place that we leave from. The church is designed to be a body that refreshes us, reinvigorates us, refuels us. Why? Because life is so hard? No. 
to stay passionate about the mission, to be filled and fueled for the mission, to be equipped for the mission. You come here to learn about how you can do a greater job fulfilling the mission of Christ. That is what the church is. And then what happens is people in the community begin looking and saying, what is going on over here? Which is why scripture says, people will know us by our love. Because the love should be so great here that it baffles an outside world. Single mothers should be taken care of so well here that it puts our government to shame. Hurting individuals in the healthcare system, they should be loved on and provided for. Provided for in what way? Every way. Every way. So well in local churches that it puts everything else to shame. And then other people start saying like, That's, is that a church? I've never seen a church do that. Is that what a church does? A church loves people like that? Takes care of people like that? I've seen these people bringing over dinner every single night after these people had a baby. I've never seen anything like that. I saw somebody give that person a car. What church you go to? They know us by our love. Instead, they know us by our judgment. Can't say amen. You ought to say ouch. Come on. Brings me to my next point. We need to be a people worth following. Some of us, we throw the whole, well, I shared the gospel with them, and, you know, it just wasn't their time. No, maybe they just didn't really, oh, I'm, should I say this? Maybe they just didn't want to be like you. You know what I mean? Maybe we're just not people worth following. Philippians 2 says this, do all things without grumbling or disputing. All right, we're, all, we're out. Out. <laughs> that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a what, church? Crooked and twisted generation among you, among whom you Read this with me. What? Shine as lights in the world. Can I ask you, are we known as followers of Jesus Christ as lights in the world? I mean, outside of our current Christian context here and the four walls of a church, as we know, are we known for that? We should be. We should be known as being different. In fact, Peter says that we are aliens not of this world. Here's the, here's the problem. Can I just be honest real quick? Here's the problem. We're supposed to be aliens not of this world, but a lot of Christians are like aliens in this world. Do you know what I mean? It's like kind of really weird. Strange. And I'm all all about like celebrating your uniqueness and your weirdness. Like fly your flag. That's great. Be weird. Okay? Here's what you can't do. Separate from society. There's only one Noah. Noah. There's only been one man that God ever called to build an ark and separate, segregate from society. That's not us. You're not Noah. I hate to break that to you. We are not. We are called to live in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. You say, well, why would God call us to live in a crooked and twisted? So that we can be lights. So that we can be different. The problem is we've tried to be so relevant We've blurred the lines between what is Christian and what's not. We've tried to be so relevant. We've we've tried to be so much like the world because we're so ashamed. We're so scared to be offensive. Listen, can I just be honest with you? I love you. The gospel is offensive. When you look at somebody and say, I'm sorry, man, there's nothing good in you. There's nothing saving in you. No matter how hard you try, you cannot work, earn, or buy your way into heaven. When you look at somebody and say, how do you get to Christ? You repent of your sins, turn from your sin, and believe in him. That's offensive. When Jesus says, I'm the only way to God, nobody gets to the Father unless they come through me. That's offensive. The problem is with a lot of Christians, they're offensive, not their gospel. Think about this now. For many generations, Christians have become offensive and softened the gospel, which is actually the offensive thing. We've done the opposite. We've watered down the gospel so it's not offensive, but we have become more offensive ourselves. You don't have to be offensive to present a strong truth. As we're going to see, you just need some relational currency. Maybe people aren't following because of who we are. There's nothing different. Let me me just break this down real fast. 
I mean, is there anything different about us? We watch the same movies. We talk about the same things. We you know, go to the same places. We drink the same things. We smoke the same things. We watch the same things. We're involved in the same... I mean, am I just... I don't mean to step on toes, but let's just be honest. Are we different? We talk the same. Maybe not in public, but behind closed doors. Talk the same. Same jokes. Maybe not in public, but behind closed doors. There's supposed to be lights in the world. By the way, I, I just I always want to throw this in there. We do need to balance this, like Peter saying, you know, aliens not of this world. I, I think that being a can I just share my heart with you? I think that being a Christian should make you a better human. I think it should make you a better father. I think it should make you a better teacher, a better mother, a better artist, a better producer, a better creator a better student. I, I do. And I get so upset. You know this is my beef. I get so upset when I hear people say, well, it's Christian. Well, I mean, you know, is it a good song? Well, it's a Christian song, so. What do you mean? What's well, Christian music. I mean, it's, it's not as good. It's, it's good. It's not as... What about that art? Well, I mean, it's like Christian art, you know, so it's not as... If it's Christian, it ought to be better. And I have no problem saying that. Why should it be better, church? If, if you own a home renovation company, your home renovations as a Christian should be better than those who don't know Christ. Because you should see your work as worship. You should be building or refurbing as unto Christ. You should be parenting, Dad, fueled by Christ. You should be producing music from the standpoint of the most creative source in the universe. You should be designing art out of the overflow of the true artist. We have that opportunity. We have that source. And instead, we have settled. We must be a people worth following. I could go on this for a while. Maybe if we became different, maybe if we were actually radically saved, maybe if we were actually being people who were believing and working for the best, people would say, I want to be like that. I got to get what they have. And so we've settled. Number three, understand you may be your friend's only link to meeting Jesus. When it comes to this idea of we bring our friends to Jesus, understand you may be your only friend's link to meeting Jesus. Do you know that Jesus puts you exactly where you are in the time period that you are and the workplace that you are in the cubicle next to who you're sitting next to so that you could be the light to that person? You don't need to ask the question. Maybe God set this up this way. Yes, your entire life has been leading up to the conversation where you introduce your, 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 the, the, the person in the cubicle next to you to Jesus. Your entire life, all of your experiences, your family tree, everything is building to that point. And it comes to this, and we don't share. We don't share. Understand, you may be your only friend's link to meeting Jesus Christ. Number four, I gotta go through these. Number four, if we wanna see people, if we wanna bring our friends to Jesus, I mentioned this before, we gotta build relational currency. What do you mean? Well, Matthew 16, great example. Starts in verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. Jesus is sharing this with his friends, his disciples. And on the third day be raised. And Peter, you gotta love Peter, by the way. Peter is like a cartoon character. Like he just puts his foot in his mouth all the time. It says, and Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Can we just pause real quick? Can we just pause? Peter, just imagine Peter. Hey, Jesus, Jesus can I talk to you for a second? Real quick? Just, yeah. Come here, come here, come here. I gotta let you know, Jesus. I, oh, are you for real? Jesus is, this is wild. Look at what he says. Peter says, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you, in reference that, that he'll be tortured, that he'll be murdered, right? Peter's like, that's never gonna happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, and by the way, pause, you'd think that Jesus would be like, you know what, you're a true friend, Peter. Thanks for having my back. I, you know, we need more Peters. Thank you. Not exactly what Jesus says. Look at what he says. He turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> I bet Peter was like, what? 
And Jesus says, you're a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Two points here. One is the context, the other is inferred. Number one, the context is the fact that Jesus is able to say this stuff to Peter because of his relationship with Peter. I mean, Jesus just straight calls Peter Satan, and Peter takes it. Is that because he's Jesus? No, it's because he built a relationship with Peter. We've talked about relational currency before. No time to talk about it here. But the understanding that you deposit over time consistently because one day you will withdraw. And a conversation about Jesus can be a withdrawal type conversation. If you love somebody, you've got to take withdrawals. You understand that? Sometimes you think you're loving something, somebody by not saying truth to them. You're not loving them. You're hurting them. Part of us as parents need to learn that. We just want to say yes because we love our kids. No, we want to say yes all the time because it's too hard for us to say no. Right? And so as somebody who cares about people who are dying and actively going to hell, you, you got to stand in that gap and you got to say, hey, listen, I know we've been knowing each other now for about a year and a half. i got to be honest with you. I care about you. You know I love you. i got to tell you about Jesus. I just, I got to, I know, just hang tight, but i got to tell you. See, I think part of the reason we don't do this is because we don't know how to like get somebody from point A to point B. The greatest freedom you will ever have is when you realize it's not on you to get them from point A to point B. It's not like, well, what about the, that prayer? What about that magic prayer? What about it? The magic prayer not found in the Bible? How are people saved? What does scripture say? By confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. And by believing that God has raised them from the dead. That are the, those are the prerequisites for salvation. You say, well, how do I share that? Share it first by showing it. Show people. Walk in obedience. Read scripture. Get somebody to read it with you. Talk to them. And, and say, this is how he's changed my life. And the Holy Spirit will begin working and moving and working and moving. I love this idea here, by the way, with Peter. Jesus says, like, like, listen, man, you're being Satan. Like, get behind me. You're a hindrance to me. Why? It's because Peter was wanting to see Jesus as a friend in that moment. Jesus was wanting to see Peter. I'm sorry. Peter was wanting to see Jesus as a friend, but Jesus was wanting Peter to see him as the Savior. Listen, I know that you want me to stick around here and be buddy-buddy, but my life is a lot bigger than that, Peter. I know you want it to be good and everything's fine. My life's about, I got to die. I got to die. I got to rise again. Stop living for only the comfortable things. Live with a greater time frame. Live with a greater understanding. See, Jesus sees time different than we do. You know that? We see birth and death. Jesus sees like existence. How much different would it be for us if we just saw existence? Yeah, death is in there. There's a little hiccup along the way. But we're created for forever. And one day you will stand, spend your forever somewhere with Jesus or apart from Jesus. And that place apart from Jesus is called hell, which is a real place. And people are really there right now. It's incumbent on us to share the gospel. Last, as we close today, last, not only do we need to build our relational currency, not only do we need to be a people worth following, not only do we need to understand that we may be our friends only linked to meeting Jesus, not only do we need to be on mission, but church, we need to be bold in our invitation. Let me read this scripture to you. Matthew chapter five says this. <clears throat> I'm going to be speaking to you right now. Listen to me, church. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Do you hear me? More importantly, do you hear God's words? You're the salt of the earth. He goes on and says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. 
Church, it's, stop, it's time that we stop praying if and start planning on when. Stop praying prayers you already have the answer to. Stop asking if you should share Jesus. You say, I haven't gotten a clear answer. He already gave you the answer before you asked the question. He gave us the answer when he said, go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And guess what? I am with you to the very end of the age. I sent my spirit to fill you. Church, the Jesus in you is better than having Jesus beside you because the Jesus in you allows you to go and spread it one to another that's on each and every one of us. Come on, what would it look like if we were a church that took seriously the mission and the commission of God? The mission of God, to spread the gospel, to share the gospel, to tell our teachers, to tell our fathers, to tell our mothers, to tell our sons, to train up our children, to tell them about Jesus and the gospel. What would it be like if we did that? I'll tell you, it would be the kingdom of God. I beg, I beg you, please let us be known as a church that cares for her city. Let us not be a church that is just so easily entertained that we forget about the mission. Let us not be a people that are okay being indifferent to the souls of those around us dying without Christ. May God wreck us. May he break us. May he dismantle us. Just bow your heads, close your eyes for a moment. Father God, would you just wreck our hearts today in the most beautiful way possible. Father, we need to repent towards you. There's so many things that we invest our lives in that just don't have eternal significance, and yet we live our lives chasing these things. Forgive us, Father. Change us. Change our heart, our trajectory, our church, our family. Change us. The Word tells us that you are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come repentance in Jesus Christ. Father, just in this moment right now, may your spirit move right now, right now. This is not a rising up of a challenge. This is not a call to a challenge. No, this is just a reminding, a reminding of what is obedient and what is not. It is out, out of obedience that we bring our friends to Jesus. Make us bold. Make us wild. Get us out of our domesticated cages and let us run free with the gospel.